Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the book event for academic well-being of visualized students. My name is Oyinda Mola Alaka, and I'm the Publicity and Promotions Manager for Fernwood Publishing. I'm excited to kick off this event tonight. Tonight's event is brought to you by SMU alumni in collaboration with Fernwood Publishing, Venice Envy, and Racialized Students Academic Network. This Zoom event is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. Please note that you can get this book, Academic Wellbeing of Racialized Students, with 10% discounts available at Venice Envy and online via Fernwood Publishing. Also note that all royalties go to Racialized Students Academic Network, and at this point, I'd like to invite someone from the Visualized Student Academic Network to make a statement. Hello, um, I'm Fison Thibault, and I would just like to um, read you all and uh, let you all know about what um, Racialized Students Academic Network is, and it's RSAN for short. So RSAN is an independent auton autonomous network of and for indigenous and black stu students and alumni and students and alumni of color at St. Mary's University in Jabuktuk Mi'kma'ki territory. The network is a gathering space to center indigenous, black and critical race feminist so scholarship, knowledge systems, methodologies and scholars, which are predominantly marginalized and omitted in everyday classes research, pedagogy, and graduate supervision. Such a critical and rare academic space ensures that students further develop their own critical theoretical vision based on intersection intersecting identities, histories, and struggles while promoting their overall academic well-being individually and collectively. The network aims to specifically decrease isolation by networking and sharing information and resources while also supporting each other to remain folk to remain focused on our courses research and completing our degrees we hope this space will promote the building of a peer community and encourage group support as well as one-on-one -on -one support we recognize that racialized, student, racialized students, indigenous and students of color experience additional barriers in the academic institution and therefore a priority goal of the network is to strive to center and support indigenous students and students of color. The network values reciprocity, responsibility, confidentiality, trust and understanding as we aim to share lessons learned with the academy. Thank you so much for that. And now I would now continue with the housekeeping for tonight. Please note that there is a chat option um, at the bottom of your screen. You can see the button to utilize the chat option. Please note that the chat is being monitored and um, any racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic comments will be deleted and you'll be kicked out of the event. Please stay muted for this event and, and only use the raise and end option, which is also at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to ask a question during the question and answer period, uh, there is an, there will be an opportunity towards the end for speakers to answer any questions that you have. So please um, keep your questions for that session. Also note that the chat has been monitored for questions. So you can leave your questions and comments in the chat and they will all be answered um, at the end of the event during the Q&A session. And now I'd like to pass the mic to Mohammed Asik, who is from the SMU, SMU alumni. Thank you very much, Ainda. Hello, everyone. My name is Mohammed, and I am one of the alumni officers at St. Mary's University. We have over 53,000 alumni all over the world, and we are always looking for ways to engage our alumni through various programs and events. Today, we are very happy to partner with Farnwood Publishing, Venus NV, and Racialized Students Academic Network to bring you this event, and we hope you'll enjoy it. I'd also like to mention that Venus NV is one of our alumni card partners, and all SME alumni receives 10% discount, so be sure to use it. We also want our alumni to stay connected with the university, so you can follow us on our social media at SME Alumni HFX on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also sign up for our e-newsletter by sending an email to alumni at smu.ca. 
Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the moderator for today's event, Timmy Idris. Timmy was born in Lagos, Nigeria. She holds a Master's of Arts in Criminology from St. Mary's University. Her area of research focuses on corruption in government, corporate crime, white collar crime, and policy development. Currently, Timmy works at Dalhousie University and is an alumni member of the Racialized Students Academic Network. For her dedication and involvement in the community, Timmy was also awarded the Young Alumna of the Year Award from St. Mary's. Over to you, Timmy. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Just wanted to say um, thank you to St. Mary's University alumni, Fernwood Publishing, Venus Envy, and Arasan for collaborating on this event and bringing the audience this special event and this special panel. Um, I would like to introduce Raymond Sewell. Um, Raymond is an alumni of St. Mary's University and he received an MA in Atlantic Canadian Studies in 2014 and has served as the Indigenous Student Advisor at St. Mary's University. He is originally from Babino First Nation, a Mi'kmaq community near Bathurst, New Brunswick. He is the founder and inaugural chair of the Atlantic Association of College and University Student Services, Indigenous Services Division. Raymond has taught previously in the Department of Religious Studies and is now an assistant professor in the Department of English. Thank you, Raymond, for being here. Lala and Timmy, thanks uh, for that introduction. Delewisin Bibugwes Malau, my name is Raymond Sewell, and I'm from uh, Winnipeg, which is Pabano, outside of uh, Bathurst, New Brunswick. I'm so happy to be here today. I'm so happy uh, with the work. Aduwakan is our methodology, storytelling methodology. And uh, all the stories I read in this book have in Bison or a medicine to them. Uh, so when I was asked to be here to provide an opening and, and to sing a, a song, uh, we traditionally sing songs at all our events to open them. I thought, this is great. I really want to be part of this. Um, so I call in the ancestors with my song, I'm uh, And I'll sing, uh, Thank you, Creator, on behalf of us. And thank you to all my relations. Uh, so here's a drum song I'd like to offer. It takes a rua, did a big young girl suit. Abu Gwan, we need this gummy new muk to add us well in it. Yo, yeah, yeah, I sing the spirit song. And what I'm saying there is, um, Creator, don't forget us. Don't let us, El Nu, Skiji El Nu people, forget Malka Ludiak, the dances, Al Sudamai, the prayers, and get a big young the song. So this is Dulkumides, that strong drum medicine. Uh, and I want to start this uh, with a good vibe and a good feeling. Uh, so thanks for having me. Thank you, Raymond, for that. How very spiritual. Thank you very much. I'm going to continue by reading my piece from the book, The Academic Wellbeing of Racialized Students. I wrote a poem in the book. Um, so this is Intersections and Contradictions by me. 
who are we? Who am I? Why do I have to explain myself for you to accept me? Shall I break myself into little accessible pieces good enough for your palate? Tenehisi Coates said, and I thought that what divided me from the world was not anything intrinsic to us, but the actual injury done by people intent on naming us intent on believing that what they have named us matters more than anything. Matters more than anything we could ever actually do. The story of us, scratch that, the story of me. Muslim, Nigerian, West African, African. Privileged yet underprivileged, independent yet dependent. I stand in this space and time, too alien for here and too alien for home. The taste of something I have lost still lingers on my tongue. What have I lost, you ask? The ability to ask for more without feeling guilty or ungrateful. Do not involve yourself in things that threaten your presence. Don't make waves, don't make noise. Shh. Be quiet. Be grateful that you were allowed in. Be grateful that you are part of the chosen few. Hold on, hold on, keep holding on. Who am I? a long line of strong, beautiful humans. My ancestors go before me, they give air to my wings. I rarely ever am just me. The weight of my communities on my shoulders, representative, spokesperson, in between, double consciousness, the paradox of belonging and unbelonging. I call it the inside from outside, insider from outside. A wavering world I thrive in, moving across spaces, but not in a vacuum. Movement comes with code switching, code switching. Our brain's an advertent way of helping us fit in, an attribute I need these days to survive. Look around you, look. Notice the little things, the ones you have silenced because their words fall off their tongues differently. In this space, it is a shock to my system when a person is a decent human because decent humans are hard to come by. Oh, how dated I have become. You have greatly added to my worldview. However, you have taken so much from me. Whew, such powerful words. I'm just gonna give you guys a few minutes to um, digest. No, I'm joking. Um, I am going to introduce all the panelists and discussants uh, at once, and then they will take it from me. Dr. Bennett Abundant is an associate professor at St. Mary's University in the Department of Social Justice and Community Studies. Her research examines organizational and institutional power relations with a focus on colonial encounters and nation building within academic spaces and workplaces. She's currently the faculty coordinator for the Racialized Students Academic Network and works with racialized students and international students at various universities to promote their scholarship, well-being, and self-advocacy in the areas of academia, tenancy, and mental health. Welcome, Benita, thank you. Dr. Dorothy Christian, is of the Shekwakmik and Silk Nations from the interior of British Columbia. Her home community of Swachin is one of the 17 communities that comprise the Shekwakmik Nation. Indigenous cultural knowledge informed her PhD at the Department of Educational Studies at UVC, which focused on indigenous visual storytelling and filmmaking practices. Dr. Christian currently serves as the Associate Director, Indigenous Policy and Pedagogy, graduate and postdoctoral studies at Simon Fraser University. Welcome, Dr. Dorothy Christian. Wayne Desmond was born and raised in the African Nova Scotian community of New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. His family originates from Margrave Birchtown Village and Upper Big Trekkery in Guysborough County. He is a St. Mary's University alumna who majored in criminology. Is currently a second year student at Dalhousie University, enrolled in the Schulich School of Law. Wayne is a committed son, uncle, mentor, and activist. Wayne formerly wrote for the Nova Scotia Advocate and worked for Mark, 
Bilbury Injury and Insurance Law Office. Hi, Wayne. Aislinn Philip completed her MA in Women and Gender Studies at St. Mary's University and is from the Caribbean island of St. Kitts and Nevis. Her research focuses on the marginalization and discrimination of women of color in prominent positions of power, authority, and leadership, particularly within academia. Aislinn currently works with NGOs as a policy development professional leading advocacy for sustainable development in the Caribbean region. Hello, Aisling from St. Kitts and Nevis. And the discussant from today is Dr. Yvonne Brown, and she is a distinguished educator in various roles as a public school teacher, university lecturer, education policy analyst, manager of international initiatives in higher education, and a school trustee. Her research interests extend beyond issues in the sociology of education to the African and diaspora history, literature, and African Black feminist philosophy. She currently researches and writes about the social, political, and economic legacies of the transatlantic slave trade, plantation title slavery, and post-emancipation in the Americas. Out of this research has come the second edition of her 2010 memoir, titled Dead Woman Pickney, a memoir of childhood in Jamaica. Dr. Brown is currently an adjunct professor in the Department of Social Justice and Community Studies at St. Mary's University. So here we have uh, a wide range of people from different places geographically, um, and we're so excited to hear from them. So I'm gonna let them take it away. Benita, over to you. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And a special acknowledgement of uh, the territories of the Coast Salish, um, where I grew up since I was seven years old for, for 37 years, of uh, the Musqueam, the Suela Tooth. Um, and uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, my relations here in Mi'kmaq. Um, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, I'm grateful that uh, Dorothy from Coast Salish Territories, who lives currently in Coast Salish is here um, with me. Um, and it's I've been wanting to bring that link back and hopefully future uh, book events will happen. Oyenda, next year uh, when I'm in BC, we'll maybe hopefully do something on the ground with people living uh, on Coast Salish territories. Um, thank you to all of you for being here, especially the speakers and to the collaborators. I'm going to mostly draw a few things from the book. Um, the book came about through several um, connections and organizing around conferences. And I want to just start with the word, the concept of academic well being. It's not a definition. Uh, that I took from somewhere. It was, I wrote the definition of academic well being uh, at the end of the book. I took the entire book to help me come with a relevant and responsible definition. So it's the capacity of academic institutions to carefully conceptualize and implement with relevance the policies, pedagogies, curricula, and services that promote the mental, physical, and intellectual wellness of students. Often academic well-being is seen as uh, the responsibility of the student. And I wanted to flip that definition because I believe it is the responsibility of institutions. Further, it is when academic institutions fail to build and deliver on this capacity that students search for spaces of comfort, mentorship, resistance, networking, and survival to then promote their individual and or collective academic well being. In this book, I focus on the ac academic well being of racialized students over three intersecting themes. The first is barriers to academic well being. The second is acts of resilience and resistance to white supremacy within the academy. And third, the nurturance of reciprocity, care, and kinship. It's crucial to note that through the book, 
uh, follows this, or although the book follows this order, these three components are always intermixing and intersecting. And they do so through scholarly work, such as chapters in thesis or poetry or art. They do so in multiple sites. They're born from multiple sites, such as conferences, networks, and research. I first met each of the contributors as students living their complex lives, which are always informed by historical, geopolitical, ancestral, collective, and individual landscapes. I affirm that their act of writing or being a contributor in this book is itself a multifaceted moment of hybridized individual and collective academic well being, full of courage, cur and rage, uh, and situated in transnational kinship relations. Dr. Yvonne Brown and I wrote the last chapter. We created that from scratch. It's born out of over 25 years of relations. And transnational kinship relation, we refer to this term as the encountering of individuals from across the globe and the making of non-blood kin relations due to struggles and experiences of otherness or outsiderness as well as collective resistance and survival. And I want to go right to the last chapter, which I haven't talked about in other book launches. Um, so in this chapter, Yvonne and I, it's called A Way of Being. Uh, we share our narratives by looking back over some 25 years of teaching and learning together from 96 to 2021. We critically describe, assess, and evaluate the kind and quality of mentoring and supports uh, that supports the academic well being of Indigenous Black African students and students of color in universities. And prior to this event, we all met um, to, to go through the event. Um, and, and Dorothy, as well as Yvonne, um, talked about how our stories is really what keeps us together. And in this is exactly what this book is about. It's about how these stories keep us together. It's, a, it's about a way of being and the journey of kin making um, across time. I wanna just read, I don't know, Timmy, how much time I have left. Am I okay? You can start rounding off a bit. Okay. Yeah. Over the next 20 years, Yvonne and I developed a friend relationship of teacher and mentor, as well as student and friend. Every chance that I could, I honored her in every day that I, in, in every way that I could. I drew on her understanding of the world and the ways that blackness and chattel slavery had touched every aspect of the world, from architecture to economics, labor and servitude, agriculture and commodities, and of course, my birthplace, Mauritius, a previous colony of the Dutch, the French, and the British. Through Dr. Brown's action, she played a particularly critical role. Uh, we had met at the University of British Columbia. She played a fundamental role in the retention of racialized students at UBC. The University of British Columbia should be very grateful to this individual for her deep commitment to higher learning. Her presence, labor, and deep intellectual and emotional commitment ensured that UBC's course offerings included curriculum concerning historical, contemporary, social, and literary presence of African Black history, literature, labor, and economics. In 2000, Yvonne facilitated a workshop that I organized on academic well being, which is ultimately. The, the seed of this book and, and some of my research. This was part of something called Aboriginal Women and Women of Color Leadership. That is 21 years ago. She then asked at this workshop to Indigenous women and women of color who were faculty, staff, and students this important question, does academia feed you intellectually, physically, and emotionally? If so, how? And if not, how not? And so from there um, is the birth of this book. And many of the uh, Wayne and Iseline were both my students. Um, Iseline uh, 
was my first MA student that I supervised at St. Mary's. And I believe, I, Celine, I'm not sure that your committee with Dr. Sila Jakrishnamurti as second reader, myself as your supervisor, and Gugu as the external was the first all racialized committee for a student. And that's something I'm very proud in, in having put together um, for you. And of course, Wayne, I am um, so amazed to continue to witness your journey um, as uh, you interact with academia. So I wanna thank you for hearing this little bit and I'll pass it over to the next person. Thank you, Benita. Um, Dr. Christian? You're muted. I'm still muted. Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here with you all. And um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am on the lands of the Musqueam, the Squamish, the Tooth, Coquitlam, Katesi, and other Coast Salish nations on whose lands all the uh, campuses of Simon Fraser sit on. And um, I call them my Coast Salish cousins because linguistically we are related. And just to expand a little bit on um, the introduction, I know that we don't talk about cultural things in these formal academic introductions, but I need to just let you know that I'm the eldest of 10. I have one daughter and over 65 nieces and nephews and great nieces and nephews. And as of May, I became a great, great auntie. Uh, and uh, so this is the first page of my um, talk. You can put the second page up now. And I was asked to do reflections on what I've been thinking about since we actually wrote the chapters for this book. And the thing that came through most of all was I felt that I needed to talk about what Indigenous knowledge is and how important it was for me when I was writing my PhD to liberate myself outside of the colonial binaries. I was so frustrated at the beginning of my graduate work when I was doing my MA. I went to lunch with my good friend, Lee Miracle, who's just recently passed on. And I remember telling her just how fed up I was with colonialism. Because up until that point, it's like we're always, I was always writing to locate myself in relation to whatever colonial practice that there was. But when it came to my PhD, I was uh, determined to privilege Indigenous knowledge. And I was able to find uh, concepts from a Torres Strait Islander, a man of color named Martin Nakata, who talked about Indigenous standpoint and uh, and also situated indigenous knowledge within the academy. So I felt like he gave me a level of freedom to some degree. So I did privilege indigenous knowledge in my PhD and indigenous knowledge is, is all about land and story. And we talked a little bit about this before, but if you come to know Indigenous peoples, you will know that each group has got stories that are directly related to the lands that we are born to. So it's really forcing me to look at the contemporary sense of the time that we are living in now in terms of the Indigenous narrative versus the colonial narrative. You know, so I, I come from the territories where the unmarked graves of the 215 were found. 
And I really believe that the silent voices of those children have shifted the narrative in this country so that people are finally beginning to hear the Indigenous narrative of these lands. I think it's important for us to ask ourselves, what stories do we tell ourselves? What stories do we tell each other? And what are the stories underneath the stories that the settler colonial, colonial peoples have told us all? You know, so it wasn't, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but it wasn't until I think 2010, I was invited to do a keynote in the Atlantic provinces at, um, oh God, I can't remember, was it St. Mary's University? Rita Deverell was teaching there and she invited me in. And uh, I remember asking her to please be sure that there was a Mi'kmaq elder there because I needed to acknowledge uh, the people and the spirits of the lands that I was traveling to. And I remember when I did that, uh, people in the audience, I could see their, their um, question marks on their faces, you know, and also that interaction taught me about how Black African peoples have been on the lands in the Atlantic provinces since the 1700s. And I'm embarrassed to say that I did not know that at the time. So I think we need to tell our stories from our perspective and not in relation to the colonial one, but how do we relate to each other within our own stories? You know, I mean, from, um, that perspective, we need to look at how that complicates our relationships to each other on these lands, in these contemporary times. You know, I mean, how many of us and how many of our own people uh, from all our various nations and cultures, how many of us and our own families have bought the stories that the colonial people have put onto us, you know, in terms of stereotypes or how they perceived how we were on the land. How do we talk about ourselves? That's, I mean, I do uh, film work as well. And I was at the Imaginative Film Festival in 2017. I curated a program and in 2018 or maybe it was 2018 and 2019 and I was very very excited about the films that I was looking at because they were coming from within the indigenous culture within the indigenous knowledge and the story becomes very different then when it's coming from within the culture and you're not having to explain your relationship to the people who are occupying your lands or having to repeat the colonial histories. I mean, it, it's like if we look at ourselves in terms of how do we recount our own history with each other rather than in relationship to the settler colonial history? How, do, how does that affect our, our ability to build kinships, as Benita is suggesting? Because um, if we start thinking about how do we become good relatives together on these lands, you know, from an Indigenous point of view, our knowledge is interrelational. We are related to all things on the land, the lands, the waters, the birds, the four leggeds the swimmers, the even the insects and the sky and the cosmos, you know, so how does that affect how we relate to each other as human beings in the academy? 
I mean, I think we are living at a time, you know, when George Floyd was murdered in March 2020, I had meltdowns in my management meetings because what I encountered in the unit that I was in was um, people who were wanting to conduct business as usual until I finally had a meltdown and said, excuse me, aren't we going to talk about what's going on on the streets around the globe? Are we not going to address the race issue? And I think that's, uh, you know, when, when people are talking about, um, you know, how do we shift things and how do we change things? And of course the big, the big, um, message is around reconciliation but what the heck does that mean in terms of action i mean reconciliation has got to become a verb but i think that in our relationship building and in our kinship making with each other and in our communities it's so critical that we tell our stories from within our own way of seeing in the world, our, our own way of doing in the world, rather than looking to the dominant Euro Western systems of knowledge that we are all very skilled at. I mean, we wouldn't be in these institutions if we weren't. We've all learned how to master the the uh, tools of the uh, of the master, as they say, you know, so how do we use those tools for our own benefits, for our benefits as people of color, as indigenous people, in terms of um, how we coexist together in this academy. Okay, I just got word that my time is up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dorothy. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move it to Wayne. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Christian. Thank you. Um, spoke on so many um, important issues that I think cross over um, into my chapter and, like you know, into I think all of our everyday lives. Um, something like you know that you've mentioned that really stood out to me is like telling our stories, like you know, from our own. Um, perspective and I think that's very true um we need to be real and we need to stop allowing others to tell our stories from their point of views and that's where we really get a little messed up with telling history um so yeah thank you for that um you know before I always speak about my chapter I always like to acknowledge um my ancestors you know the harm that they endured like through the transatlantic um slave trade and then coming here to Canada which we often view as um a safe place, but we need to be honest and realize that slavery happened here. It happened here in Nova Scotia, in Cape Breton. Um, whether you want to call it a um, indentured servant, it was slavery. Um, and then acknowledging the ones that are still living, my elders, my peers, and then the younger ones that are coming behind me, because um, they're carrying that like pain through generations and generations. And then the ones that are about to come up, like, you know, the ones that aren't living, it's very important, like, you know, for me as an African Nova Scotia man to really work hard on um, navigating these systems so that I can just make it easier and really just try to make a shift in society so it's more bearable that they don't have, have to be telling these stories, like, you know, that we're telling today. Um, yeah, so my chapter really focused um, on, first I wrote it for the Nova Scotia Advocate, um, First, and Benito was like, I think this would be a very good addition, like, you know, in the book. So I was just real in that chapter, just like speaking on um, my experience from like, you know, entering the public school system um, in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia, um, right until I, so I would say from 2002, right until 2016. Um, just what we endured as students like that and students of color, um, having white educators, like, you know, just really beat us down and not inject like, you know, that love and that confidence that like, you know, we need as students to flourish. Um, 
not going to go into the chapter um, too much, but I always just have to acknowledge um, this one man when I was in grade 11. So I was 16 years old and he asked me what I want to do. And this is the man I often speak of, New Glasgow broken up into areas. And when I speak of the West Side, that is the affluent area where, you know, they drive the Mercedes, the Lexus and all those big houses and gated communities, essentially so. This man asked me one day, what did I want to do when I graduated? Because, you know, in that time. So I told him I want to go to law school and want to be a lawyer and hopefully one day a judge. So, you know, I was expecting a better response, but he told me that I should reconsider in that a plumber, being a plumber would be a good, um, good job, good occupation for me to um, embark on. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with going into the trades. There's nothing wrong with going to community college. But what really stuck out to me was that I wasn't viewed as any more than just going to community college and getting a trade as a black man. And I think it really speaks to slavery, just viewing our bodies as um, laborers. So it was just something that really like, you know, stuck out to me. And I really just had to write on um, Last night, I was fortunate enough to go to um, a focus group in New Glasgow, and it's, um, we spoke about um, what we can really do to, um, I guess, better support African Nova Scotian students um, in the education system. And like during that like table talk that we had, it was very intense, very heavy. Um, when I got to see like people that I look up to that are like now. 40s and 50s, them breaking down and telling the stories of how they were harmed within the school system because they were beaten down so much and they were just treated as if they didn't belong within education. So it was just something like, you know, that it really made me start to reflect to see, okay, so when they were in school in the 80s, this is what they were going through. When I was in school in the 2000s, this is what they were going through. And now, well, let's just say 2020, that the students in 2021, these students are still facing this trauma within the education system because we wouldn't be sitting around that table last night if things were changing. It just makes me reflect back. It's like, we have tons of reports here in Nova Scotia. We have the Black Report on Education that was submitted to um, the provincial government in very few things. Um, were adopted out of that report. We had in 2007 reality check, which was to like reevaluate and re like address, well revisit those um, recommendations that were done in 1994. And as a result, we still have these reports that are coming. Hopefully by the end of 2022, we'll have a new report with some recommendations for the government. But the main thing here is like, you know, things aren't changing. Um, we're working in this racist system. We're working in um, colonialism. And that's just the only way we can put it. Now, moving into the university setting, I will say the first time that I felt valued as a student within um, Benita's class, Dr. Bungeon, when I was able to see myself as somebody that belonged in academia, I saw African Nova Scotian people, people of color represented in the actual material. And like, that's when I really learned about critical race theory and it just blew my mind. I knew that I was going to law school, but over the last few years, I realized that I need to really get back to my roots and go and do a master. So like, God willing, that is my plan. Um, and yeah, not much has changed. And um, thank you very much. I think I'm at my time. Thank you very much, Wayne. I see. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm really pleased to be here joining this evening and this March. Really thank you to uh, the alumni office at SCU for hosting this event. I think this publication is really timely. And I think it's uh, certainly the first of its kind that I've, I'm aware of in terms of having students, um, especially in, from different levels, be able to publish um, with, within sort of kind of an academic journal that's been used um, and referenced. So I'm really grateful to be here and to be following um, my presentation. I think the chapter that I wrote really sought, it was based on my research, which really sought to expose and really kind of put a highlight on the reality of underrepresentation that we have within our universities. And my research really focused on St. Mary's University and Dalhousie, 
particularly as it relates to the underrepresentation or just the absence of um, Black women as faculty, and that's also connected to other women of color, like Indigenous women as well. And I think now that I think about it, so I did this research like three years ago now, it feels, you know, it's like quite a while ago, but I did it either two years ago now, and the data is certainly dated. And now I think about it, you know, I consider my presentation to this evening kind of, well, what are my reflections now at this point in time in terms of um, how the problem has shifted, um, have there been changes, and what does that mean in terms of uh, the well-being of students? So I think we, we are at a time where we understand that representation matters. And we've heard that a lot. There's been quite a bit, a bit of research on that within academia, even outside of academia, we're seeing even within the corporate world, there's a push for more um, diversity and inclusion. There's all of that's happening. We're seeing there, there've been a push for new hires, particularly as we saw um, the, the incident with George Floyd, which Dr. Christian mentioned, you know, as the pandemic hit, it seems like the world, <laughs> Um, um, or non-racialized individuals somehow woke up and was like, wow, there's really this sort of injustice, cannot believe it, even though it's been happening to folks all the time for centuries, for decades in different ways. Um, and so I think with that, we saw this bigger push for there to be positions um, created for racialized faculty, for black faculty, for indigenous faculty. And there seems to have been like, it was trending for a while. We were trending in terms of really trying to improve representation, particularly in our universities, because there's more and more research published. And I, I would like to think that my research was just an added voice to what was already being done to say, this is a problem, despite the fact that we have all of these equity policies that say um, we, we value this as, as, as being beneficial to the university and to the institution, the reality is that there is vast and acute underrepresentation and there is lack of support, which affects students, which Wayne's chapter and his presentation pretty much highlights and, 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 and reiterates in terms of the way that it affects um, students and their education and their well-being within these spaces. And so as I think about you know, I kind of wonder, well, how far have we come considering all that has been done, considering how much we've been trending? And you know, in some ways, I think we have seen certain gains where we've seen certain hires, but then in other instances, I think particularly because of the pandemic, we've also seen that things have been stagnant in certain places, um, in certain institutions. And this has been quite particularly problematic, um, I think, because it not only makes you, I feel like part of the issue that my research kind of highlighted for me was that these policies in terms of employment equity and wanting to improve diversity was very, it was just kind of talk. There's a lot more talk as opposed to the kind of action that we need to see. And not only did um, we start to see, okay, we're gonna make an effort. I think there's effort that has certainly been made, but it's how do we ensure that even within these institutions, when we do make hires, that these spaces are actually able and ready to support um, uh, scholars uh, in their work and scholars in their growth and development so that they can then also uh, help students in a beneficial way. And so I think in some ways there have been gains in terms of recognizing and there's a lot more talk. I think the voices of scholars like ourselves has become a lot louder and grateful to Fern and publishing for for publishing um, the work that we've done in order to ensure that these issues are at the forefront. But at the same time, I believe that in light of all that's happening, no more than ever, spaces of these, these spaces of kinship that we create amongst ourselves and the need for us to, to, to have these connections and relations like Dr. Christian mentioned is become, is, is even more eminent now than it was before, especially since we're seeing that there seems to be mobilization and perhaps it could be tokenism in some ways but there's more mobilization where i think now more than ever we really do need to have more conversations about how we can support each other especially as we enter these spaces and continue to push to see how these spaces which were never created for us how we can actually ensure that we retain um, persons who are already in there and also encourage others to enter and create those spaces for ourselves so 
I'm looking forward to kind of um, uh, leave time for the discussion, discussion, Dr. Brown to, to, to lead us to, to the discussion, but I would wrap up now and kind of say that I would hope that just kind of in reflecting the ways that we can improve our academic well-being, I do believe it does we have a big role to play in making sure that we can continue to sustain and maintain these spaces of kinship um, so that we can continue to, to build each other up and, and create these spaces for ourselves. So I'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much, Arsene. Dr. Brown, I'll let you take it away. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, a place on Turtle Island that I'd like to acknowledge. I acknowledge that I am an Afro-Jamaican settler living and working on the traditional territory of many original indigenous nations included, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Chippewa, and Wendat. Toronto is also home to many diverse First Nations people, Inuit and Métis. I acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit. I would also like to acknowledge um, the colleagues and friends and relatives in Coast Salish territory on the West Coast, where I spent 39 years, 31 of which on the University of British Columbia campus. And I'm very indebted to the kinship that relations that the First Nations House of Learning colleagues uh, formed with myself. From them, I learned the vocabulary of talking about my own history. And I learned to um, uh, walk sideway, but side by side, learn from them, and to uh, be informed by their own knowledge frameworks, as um, Dorothy has pointed out. I am also like to um, acknowledge St. Mary's University for enabling the formation of the Social Justice and Community Studies Department, um, uh, of which a professor Benita Bunjan and Professor Valerie Johnson and Daryl, uh, please help me here, Benita. Uh, Daryl. Um, Daryl Lavril. Yes. Rachel and Zellers. And Rachel Zellers, who have been the people who have uh, made that department grow into the influential department that it has become. And I am very proud to have been asked to be the evaluator for the program as proposed at the time of um, accreditation. So I have a very um, special relationship with that department. And of course, um, Benita has told you already of the relationship that we have shared. I am very interested in the question of stories. Um, one thing that brings all of us here both those who are in the speaking audience and the listeners, is that we are all have found or descended from a place in one or other of the Western European empires. If you could draw a map or visualize a map, we have Timi from West Africa, Nigeria, which was part of what the colonials categorized as the slave coast. Imagine that. Then we have myself from the British Caribbean, as well as Iseline. Um, Jamaica is a larger island, and we like to look down on the smaller islands like St. Kitts Nevis and talk about the small islanders. Yes, we have our own social stratification and divisions within that colonial paradigm. We have Dorothy who's rep is, um, rep I would say, um, is a personification of the indigenous peoples in both the Americas, North and South, whose land was taken 
and this place whose lumber was converted into the large ships that enabled the maritime eco capitalist economy to begin and thrive. And right here and in uh, um, Benita, although she's from Mauritius, she had her ancestors have a connection in the British project in India and Mauritius. And Wayne, you have your connection with both the continent of Africa and the 13 colonies, colonies and their, their um, conquest, their games of conquest and colonization and your story. And I am interested in story because each one of us is an embodiment of that history, that colonial history. And Dorothy spoke about the, um, uh, we are very good at the colonial stuff they teach us because they said, they told our ancestors that, you know, even if we enslave you or turn you into indenture or take or steal your land, what we're really doing is civilizing you. So one set of people that we learn about in the academy is the Enlightenment philosophers. How many of you have been introduced to the Enlightenment philosophers? Show hands, right? And we are, we are told, thank you, we are told how wonderful they are because they were the architects of the civilization that we all enjoy. Now, Dorothy, I want to take something I picked up from your chapter. You, um, and I'm emphasizing the stories that we are em that are embodied in us, in our skin color, in our brain, everything, because we are. I have in my own writing, I characterize myself as the ghost made flesh, and haunting the halls of the academy asking to be spoken truth to about my ancestors and my mother's people and what became of them. So I want us all to talk some more about those sto embodied stories that we've inherited from our ancestors. Dorothy's ancestors said, go to school to learn how these people think. Is that familiar to all of us? Why do we go to school? What did our ancestors tell us? So I am interested in all of us talking about those stories that we came and learned from our elders that we've taken in our cultural luggage or wherever we come from to this place. And how does that inform your academic well-being and the kinds of questions you ask? Who would like to take that up? This is a question for everyone for the panel. What did your grandmother tell you? What did your grandfather? All of us are victims of colonization in wherever we came from to this country. What did your ancestors tell you that enabled you to survive the onslaught of colonialism? Story time. To me was resilience and strength. Who's talking? I'm Oksana. Pardon me? My name is Oksana. Oh, yes, Oksana, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, resilience and strength. What does that look like? Uh, not just enduring things, but also I think even now as I'm older, I think I'm learning more like about expressing my voice and what it looks like, not just, I know that we talk a lot about race, you know, I'm in the US, but also I'm from Africa, Angola, and I know we did have um, a lot of things that we experienced there and we we're colonized by the Portuguese. So I'm still familiar with the ancestors and learning history and what they were like in conversations with my mother. And I realized it's really a, just a repetition of history all over again. And also being aware since we're here representing many lands that it's really a universal thing as far as the ancestors and the history, even with racism and obviously um, we need to be thought. And I love what I'm hearing so far about the reconciliation, what uh, Dorothy, Miss uh, Dorothy Christian was explaining earlier and 
as far as, um, you know, just the stories we want to tell. I do believe that. I think that's the only way to be able to express our voice and tell our stories uniquely, but also to realize that we're, although we might be from different lands, that we do have something unique in storytelling. So, yeah. Okay. Wayne, what, what, what did, uh, you know, the Nova Scotian history of the Nova Scotian people who came through the Black law Loyalist era and the promises that talk to us about those stories and how your ancestors, what did they tell each other to survive? I want to please tell the audience some of the, those, that kind of knowledge. Something that I really um, noticed more from the older generation, I can't say my grandparents, but definitely my great grandparents, um, something that was often reinforced was to put your head down and work hard. Don't do anything that sticks out to the white man that will make you notice that could put a target on your back. Their method of survival was just going to work, doing what they were told, and they accepted the fact that they were just servants, whatever you want to call it, and they accepted this whole idea of racism because they looked to, and I apologize, I often refer to them, the, I say white a lot like that, but I'm sure that's part of my trauma, but um, looked as like, you know, the white man, their bosses, let's just say slave owners, as the man, almost as if they were a form of government. So the same way that we abide by the laws, they abided by what was told to them to survive. I think back to the stories that I hear of my grandmother, her mother going and cl cleaning a house for a full week to get a pig's head. And that's what her um, take home was. And she may do with that, may do with that so she could survive and that she could feed her family. In more of my generation now, um, something as we become more awoke um, and more aware of the things that are going on around us, especially like with George Floyd. So like, you know, violently, like, you know, murdered in clean, like clear day. Um, my parents, my mother, um, especially like, you know, she pushes us to challenge things. She pushes us to get education and to do better so that her philosophy is like, you know, if you're doing better like that, the generation behind you has something to look up to. She said, when I was growing up, she's like, I didn't have people, she's like, with PhDs like that. She's like, people going to university. So by her pushing me and pouring all that positivity and telling me that I can do things, I was the first one on her side of the family to graduate with a university degree. So as you can see, there's a shift in time and we were just so, I guess, like, you know, beaten down as a culture and stuff. And another thing, I guess, that really kept us grounded was religion even though like, you know, in the name of religion, slavery came and racism was adopted and it was, um, I guess, justified through it, but that was just our connection. Like, you know, and I think um, a lot of people that are still um, on the continent of Africa like that, they can relate to it. probably not Christianity, but um, some form of religion or something um, to look up to. Okay. Um... Benita, what did your grandmother and mother and grandparents tell you? What were the stories of survival and critique of colonialism that you were told or you live with? Let me say you live with and you live by. Mm -hmm. I, I would say I remember my grandmother well, doing an interview with her about indentureship and trying to better understand the relationship between African slaves and uh, the contact between the first indentured laborers who arrived in Mauritius and their contact with uh, African slaves who said, we are not gonna do this for free anymore. And so her telling the story of how the British then had already prepared a large stock of workers in India because Britain was occupying India at that time to then replace um, this labor, but into a different form in terms of indentureship. And one story I remember when I was little that she told me is that on Sundays, 
um, the white plantation owners did not want anybody to walk the streets on Sundays because that was their holy day. And if you were caught walking, you would be severely whipped and beaten. And she remembered as a child um, a person who had had taken off his shirt or had he had walked on Sunday and he was heavily beaten. And she remembers she has this vivid memory of brutality and violence when he showed his back to her uh, that was severely marked. And so she she had probably a grade five, uh, but she certainly uh, uh, rooted social justice and how to uh, engage. With, I mean, we were taught very young how to be with white people. Um, and how how to be with white people, and at the same time, how to be like white people. Mm. So, so my mother always saying, "You've played in the sun for too long. Two hours is up. You're going to be dark. Uh, who will marry you? Uh, how will you become successful?" Um, so, I think these are some of the stories. Um, and I think today, you know, the very famous fair and lovely creams that are sold all over the world around skin color and and often white my my white students are so shocked to hear how every little brown girl or racialized girl across the globe often is given this fair and lovely cream to to tame that skin color so that's that's what i'll leave uh, leave it with okay thank you um i salute dorothy i am coming to you i can just see the the wheels turning so let's hear from uh, Iseline. What stories did your ancestors tell you in St. Kitts Nevis? Um, I think it's very similar to what um, we've heard already. So I think in growing up, education was always something that was pushed. Education was the, the avenue through which we could uplift ourselves. So my grandmother, her mom, my great grandmother was um, a cane cutter. So St. Kitts, we were a sugar cut. We were colonized by the British, obviously. Um, and, you know, sugar production is what we were, we're, very, we're known for. We were actually in sugar production for years up until the 2000s. We stopped producing sugar. Um, and so, you know, for us in terms of just, even though it wasn't, even though we were, we would have been independent, we continued with sugar production. And so we have class society where the majority of the population were cane cutters because everybody still worked in the fields they still manufactured sugar and so in order for us to get out of an uplift ourselves in terms of class and status education was the avenue through which poor people people who were not were not of the planter class um, could get ahead and of course education that was of Europe and North America everybody wanted to go to first it was the UK then it became the US, then it became Canada. And it's always the education that is out there is almost like, it was always seen as most valuable. If it doesn't matter what university you get it from, but if you got it from a university that was not in the Caribbean, it was always seen as most valuable. But I think because of that, you know, that was the story that was told. You kind of need to know how to speak, you know, to know how to think. And it was, kind of in a way of, you know, similarly just being able to assimilate in some ways to be able to assimilate, to speak, to speak and talk the talk um, because it would seem that, that, that's what provided you with being able to, to, to become better, to become, to uplift yourself. And so that was always pushed throughout my family. Education was always big, hence my own aspirations of going to university and seeking higher education. Um, and I would say another thing, in terms of stories that were told from what I understand, you know, just finding ways to support each other. Um, community is very big. Um, um, and, you know, those kind of community bonds um, and ways to be able to ensure that we support each other within whatever um, class or, 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 or sense of poverty that we're in, those are very important. And I imagine that came out of the history of slavery um, and experiencing that within plantation society in the Caribbean, where you kind of had to lean on each other. So community ties are very big, even though I've been away for so long and I've you know recently um, moved back home. The same community that my parents grew up in, that um, their parents grew up in, where they you know where where I was kind of 
known to be open. People know me because of the fact that, oh, all you have to, they ask this question all the time. Who you for? Like, mm-hmm. who's your mom? Who's your dad? And all of a sudden they can like put the pieces together because those ties, community bonds are so very important. Um, and I think that's one of the ways that we've always been able to get by, whether it's a matter of, oh, my daughter is going off to university. That would have been a whole community um, celebration because it's like, oh, somebody is getting to go because education is the thing that really is, that means we're going to get uplifted. It's not just you, but it's everybody. And there's that expectation that you have your education, you're going to come back and you're going to help us all. Um, so I'd say those are the stories. Okay. Oh boy. I love it. Um, <laughs> Uh, Timmy, I'm going to give you a few seconds to tell us from Nigeria. What are the stories your Nigerian ancestors tell you about? Um, okay, it's a little bit different for me. Um, white people were not really a central um, part of my growing up because um, thankfully, after colonization, they left um, and well, not thankfully, that seems weird. Um, but they left Nigeria and we were really um, very indigenous and we really tried to grow our country on our own. That, I'm not, um, that doesn't say that there wasn't a lot of the Western influences on the country. But I would say that for me, when I was growing up, it was always my parents and my grandparents and my family members just telling me that I had all the tools I needed to survive and to succeed. However, I would say that um, just thinking about the language and even the geographical makeup of Nigeria, because Nigeria is made up of over 250 ethnic groups, which at this point right now, I don't think wants to stay together, but we were just a, a colonial experiment by the British and we were forced together. So. Um, Though English is our official language, we know that the influence of language on Nigeria cannot be, I think it's a very big piece because sometimes how people think is not, is very, very different from how they talk. And I think that's uh, something that is interesting for me when I think about language and telling stories. Thank, Thank you. you. Dorothy, your paper, I was fascinated by your development and elaboration of in the, your nation's storytelling, and you're a filmmaker. Can you tell us how the evolution, you know, of your stories to where you're using the medium of film? Tell us what you're doing there, because it's very, very fascinating. What I'm doing where in terms of visual talk, storytelling? The whole thing, because you talked about in the beginning how you would tell stories in a communal setting. And you've 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 you in your work you've gone through the different um, ways in which indigenous people have found ways to tell, continue to tell stories. And you yourself, your scholarship have moved right through where you are a filmmaker, telling indigenous stories through that medium. And I found that very that history of storytelling very fascinating in your paper. Can you talk about that? I don't know if I've made myself clear. Well, I think that um, it has to go back to my childhood always, right? And I was very fortunate and blessed to be raised by my grandfather and grandmother who did not go to any white man's school. So I hung out with the old people and I was always under the table <laughs> as a little person listening to their stories. And I knew better than to come out and voice my questions when the visitors were still there. I had to wait until they were gone and then I'd come out and I'd ask, why did so-and-so say that or why did so-and-so? So I've always had this 
um, my, one of my great aunties, she said to me one time, you, she said, I'm going to call you curiosity because you're always asking questions. And I think that to this day, I'm still asking questions. And how I ended up um, making stories for the screen, I mean, it's a very, um, it's a fairly complicated story because it's based in my spiritual practice. Because I went up the mountain and I fasted and I asked the creator and the spirits of the land, what is my purpose here? What am I supposed to be doing here? And the first dream that I had, these men were carrying in a television set. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I haven't shared this story publicly before. But I remember I was so astounded, you know, I remember screaming at them in the dream to get the damn TV out of there because it was not spiritual. <laughs> and um, it was years until I realized I was every roadway into television producing opened up for me after I did that fast up the mountain. You know, so I pay attention to my spiritual messages that I get, you know, and I know that the Academy does not um, like to talk about spirit, but I know that we are all very spiritual people, you know, and, and we tend to hide that, you know, when we are in the Academy. So uh, this is the first time I've talked about that. So that's how I ended up. I wasn't, I've never gone to film school. I've never, like none of those. I was actually trained on the ground by a black woman mentor of mine who had been a broadcaster and she mentored myself along with many other indigenous and other women of color in the film and television industry. And the network that I ended up working for was called Vision TV, for God's sakes. Yes, I remember that. I remember <laughs> that. I, like I said, it took me a few years for the light bulb to even go off and for me to connect those dots. You know, but I, I also think that it's, it's very, like I said, I always go back to my childhood and I come from an egalitarian society. It's not gendered. People are honored for the gifts that they carry, not for the genitalia that they own, <laughs> that are attached to their bodies. You know, it's like we have women hunters in my nations, both nations, you know, so, um, my grandparents and the the other old people that I hung out with, they always treated me like like I had a voice. When they spoke to me, they talked to me like they were actually asking me what my opinion was on on things. They didn't try to talk down to me, you know, and I tend to be that way with the children in my family. You know, it, it's like uh, treating people. So I think with that kind of upbringing, I think I was probably very obnoxious to the white people, you know, <laughs> because I, I just assume a stance of equality, you know, and, you know, I mean, I'm, I know that I've had racism in my life throughout my life, but it, I mean, I always knew enough to stand up for myself as an equal, even though I'm not very big, I'm, I'm short, you know, but it's like, I know that that's the presence that I bring, you know, and I can remember saying in uh, academic settings, I am a sovereign, autonomous, indigenous woman, you know, and so that's the mindset that I come from. 
and I was brought up in a territory where the land is ours. We have never given it up, you know, and I mean, there's documentation of the chiefs of my region meeting with the Prime Minister of Canada in 1910, you know, and talking about, you know, the settler peoples coming on to our lands, you know, so I come from a people who are not afraid to stand up. You know, so I really am grateful, you know, to my old people, you know, for giving me um, the way that I see the world and the way that I conduct myself in the world. And it's always been important for me to tell the story from an Indigenous perspective, because even when I started at Vision TV, um, I had to go head to head with one of the vice presidents because, of course, Vision TV was the multicultural, multi faith network. And his idea of Indigenous spirituality was um, priests burning Indigenous medicine in the church. You know, and I said, if those are the kind of stories you want, then I'm the wrong person. I quit right now. So then they finally said, okay, then show us what you mean. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started telling stories from an Indigenous perspective. Okay. So, so I would like to, um, Timmy's warning that my time with you as discussant is up. And I'd like to thank each one of you for your contribution to this discussion today. And I do appreciate the stories that you carry with you from your ancestors, because that's what we bring to all the spaces that we enter as we interact with each other. And I hope today's panel has, and the book that's associated with it has info, given you a sense of confidence to begin to build those kinship relations through the stories we tell of origins and our elders. Thank you so much for the privilege, uh, Benita. This has been wonderful. And the last thing I'd like to say, um, Iseline, the mention of sugarcane got me really, really excited because the cover of my book has sugarcane on it purposely. And some of my Jamaican friends don't like, you know, that education that you spoke about, about Western education, respectability. I got a message on my phone once saying, what are you doing with the bamboo on your, the cover of your book? And I don't like the title, you know, because it's, you know, sort of lower class. But my point is that there are certain stories that we come with that's encoded in the language that we also bring from those places. Even though we speak the colonial language and many of us speak it better than the people who gave it to us, we also come with our own language that we bring to the, and the, the, the proverbs and so on that we think critically through. Okay, so dead woman picnic is the vernacular from where I come from for um, mo motherless me and motherless people and a metaphor for the destruction of Africa by the colonials. So everyone, thank you so much for the privilege. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Brown and everyone for answering the questions. Um, so now it's time for the Q&A. So I would ask the audience to ask, to put their questions in the chat box and we will be sending them to the panelists and the discussants. If you have a specific question to ask, a specific person, please let me know in the chat box. Thank you very much. And Timmy, we only have a few minutes left. Yeah. Uh, so if it's okay with the 38 people on the call, if uh, on the Zoom, if we'll just extend it for about five minutes, um, just to respond maybe to only one or two questions. Thank you.
we can continue to chat until the questions come in. Um, Yvonne, I've just posted uh, the link to your book uh, on the chat so that uh, people can take a look. Dorothy, I was trying to look for one of the, the films. I think there was one specifically I remember we screened at UBC. Um, can you please help me remember? Was it about land or are you able to post it in the link? A spiritual land claim, it's called. The spiritual land claim. I have a question. The question is for Dr. Evan Brown. You have fought for so many years um, and you've been involved in the academy for so many years. From the beginning of your career to now, in the supports that are provided for students of color, um, do you think anything has changed? Do you think they have more support? And I know as a Black woman in the academy, people would come to you for things other than schoolwork. Um, so in that sense, the emotional labor, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, well, I have retired some 13 years now, so I don't know what is happening within the academy right now. But what I do observe is that your generation, the young people who've been born from the 80s onwards, are doing marvelous things in the academy. They're doing unusual pieces, asking very important questions, and they are publishing. Oh my good. I, I, I'm very, 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 very excited about what I see being published by the young people born after the 1970s. So to me, um, when I look back on my own days as a student in the 70s beginning at UBC, I did not have the kind of literature written from any, I had no African Caribbean nothing scholarship, nothing. And I became a parrot that I parrot back in order to get my piece of paper. But somewhere around the 90s, I had a, 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 a crisis of identity and a crisis of homelessness, homelessness and unbelonging. And I asked myself, what do we say for ourselves? What do we as a people, Africans, Black people, what do we say for ourselves? And there began a different kind of exploration. And I was able to then teach differently, advise students differently. I could hear the students from Africa and the Caribbean in a different way, students from the colonies, as well as students who are descendants of the Irish, the Scots, the British, because not all white skinned people are privileged. They, in Nova Scotia, for example, the Irish could tell you a story. The, 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 the Scots could tell you a story and so on. So um, I don't know what else has changed, but I would hope that the kinship relations among students have changed since my time. And it's, some, it's a story that you need to tell how the kinships and, and the book has begun to tell about some of those kinship relations and how it's done and so on, okay? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, and from what you said, I think I'm going to borrow what you said and write a piece uh, on it and title it, What Do We Have to Say for Ourselves? Yes, I think that's yes. really powerful. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I have an article published where we separate with self, Black people's African slash Black people's autobiographies because we have some lot to say and every single group has much to say. Okay. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, I see that Siobhan has a question. If you can put yourself off me. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for all that you've offered um, in this uh, talk today. Hello, dear friend, Benita. Um, my question is, um, now, as this is framed uh, very specifically in relation to the racialized experience in academia, I invite a question that says, how do you see transferability um, in other systemic areas of oppression, uh, perhaps beyond the, the academic uh, arena for the, for the material that you're sharing? 
who would like to go for that? I didn't hear one part of it, Siobhan. How do you see, and I missed the key concept oh. you're looking for. <laughs> what is the transferability of the message of um, that you're sharing outside of the sphere of academia in other areas where um, systemic oppression uh, exists for specifically racialized bodies? Mm -hmm. Okay, who would like to go with that? I, can I jump in there for a minute? As a teacher, and the way I began to teach when I investigated slavery, and when I stopped talking to people about, people would invite me to their classes at UBC to talk about my experiences. And the expectation was that I would come with the pom-poms and the drums and say how grateful I am to be here, et cetera, et cetera. And that was part of it because indeed I'm grateful to be here. But when I started talking about the political economy of racism, when I started to talk about institutional racism, when I started to talk about the curriculum and all the racism that was embedded, and, and when I talked about the expurgation of history that happens, um, one historian, uh, a Haitian historian from Haiti says, you know, um, the, there is the past. History is not the past. History is an account of the past. And there are several accounts of the past. And so far, those in power are the ones who write the history, like the curriculum that we are, that we are used to. And he says, it, there's a past. And there is what is, and there is what happened in the past, and there is what is said to have happened. So as each of us from wherever we come begin to write back to the main narrative, the grand narrative it's called in some instance, we are getting different accounts of the past. And it is my hope and observation to answer your question is that as we influence the, the academy is hesitant to change the curriculum. You could talk until thy kingdom come, they ain't changing it. But we as teachers and students can be subversive in our scholarship. We can bring in the references, we can ask the questions and so on. And my thing is I'm in that kinship that we build in the classroom, I'm hoping that people will take away from it the kind of knowledge that will allow them to intervene in whatever workplace or assignment they are. Mm -hmm. I know that in my own experience, I taught a course on black women in the African slash black women in the Americas. And it changed those, there were many women's women studies uh, majors in the class. And Benita can testify to what I'm saying. When they went from that class, it changed the discourse in the women, other women's studies courses, because they got the kind of knowledge from my class that they would put up their hand and say, but so-and-so, and they were able to quote the scholarship, Black women's scholarship and intervene. And if I could follow through with the example, here is Benita then in her own practice, making changes from the different stories. She, she learned, she went to the uh, learn about, one of the things I did as a student advisor is say, Hey guys, go take a course in ethnic studies, go take a course in First Nation studies, go take a course in religions of the world and so on. So that when you become a teacher, you will have an academic base in which to build a critical pedagogy. And you could, in my own observation in that faculty, you could see the few classes that I was allowed to teach. I could see students who were ex exposed their assignments indicated that they had some knowledge to be aware when something is not right, whether it's class or an ethnicity or race, and they intervened. So um, uh, it, it's, it's uh, um, what we're doing, I hope will add up to a critical mass of voices that wherever, whichever institutions we find ourselves in, we have the tools with it to intervene. So I don't know if that, um, helps to forward the discussion on how we make changes. Huh? Does it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Dorothy, did you want to add something? I'm your mic is 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 on already. Okay. Well, I think that when we stop to think about the questions, right? What stories are we telling ourselves and to each other? I think that the changes will be infused in all of the various institutions that we engage with. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that there's any one pathway to it, but many pathways to it. You know, and if we're all working as long, I keep saying to people, we need to be all in the same dream, yes. right? <laughs> and all working together in that same dream, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, we all know that it exists systemically in all the institutions that we have to live and work within. And um, yeah, so it, it's like, we need to just uh, keep, keep at it. Don't give up, keep up your energy. Look after yourself, make sure you engage in self care. When we're talking about academic well-being, you know, that's one of the primary is to make sure that you look after yourself because you're of no use to anyone if you're sick. Yeah. Right? Mentally, emotionally, or spiritually, you know, so it's like, look after yourself. Yeah. Self-care is primary. I feel that Yvonne tells me this weekly, that Benita, you're no good to anyone. I do want to say, Siobhan, first, I want to uh, pay pay, uh, acknowledge your work in the city of Vancouver as an artist. And as, as uh, we sat together on a collective many, many years ago, um, but the encountering of each other, it is transferable, just like Dorothy said, to, to every, every encounter in every space, whether individual, collective or institutional. So, so much of my work is about, I focus a lot on the colonial encounters within, um, the academy, but also through nonprofit. And I know you've worked in many nonprofit organizations or uh, law firms, Wayne, or nonprofits, Iceline. And I think to me too, you're in institutions that this encountering, these hierarchies get reproduced. Um, and so our well being are impeded all the time. So I think it's about building capacity, keeping those relations strong. And, and, you know, right now we're, we're looking at a course at St. Mary's um, uh, with five Indigenous instructors and one of our main themes are to slow down, to slow down so we can actually acknowledge the relations we have and to resist academia's massive push towards uh, capitalist productivity, which is really uh, a, a main basis of, of academic work. And so Right now, at my university, there was an announcement today made um, uh, for a position around equity. Um, now, considering it was a position about equity, we would have thought that it would have uh, engaged in ways of uh, equity conduct, uh, where it would have been an open call, and we would have engaged in finding people with the expertise. But my university today chose to appoint a person, uh, and and with no transparency and no uh, discussion with uh, uh, the the very small group of people. And so today, my well being definitely went down. Um, my well being definitely went down because. Uh, just as we think we're moving uh, into a space of care for uh, each other in our institutions, uh, we get certain news that actually um, um, halt that process. So what, what will intervention look like and how do we maintain that well-being um, is, is, but we're only able to survive those moments through these strong kinship relations. There's, I absolutely, 
believe in that, that that is the only way. You cannot be in academia or in nonprofit organization and be isolated or in workplaces. We are not meant to be people who are completely isolated. We are meant uh, to keep uh, working on our relations with each other. Um, and I want to acknowledge the day of my defense, Dr. Brown was there. She flew from Toronto, made sure that I, and Noga, Noga, you're on this call. You know, I want to acknowledge Noga Gale. You know, the whole community came out. Nobody could touch me on that day because the entire community came out. And on that day, Dorothy, with my other uh, friends who identify as Indigenous, played a fundamental role in ultimately engaging in ritual uh, to acknowledge um, the work that we're doing. So I think that is really what I want to leave it at, uh, Siobhan, but I want to recognize your work also. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Um, we are 13 minutes past the time that we're supposed to end the event. So unfortunately, we're not going to be taking any more questions. I just wanted to say thank you to Venus Envy and Mohammed from Samir University alumni and Oina from Fernwood and Fazila and Bev. And special thanks to Dr. Benita Bundin for starting this work. We're really looking forward to the second edition. I'm already thinking about what to write about. Um, I'm a world famous author right now, you know. Um, <laughs> Also, special thanks to Dr. Yvonne Brown and Dr. Dorothy Christian, Wayne, Isoline. It's always nice to gather here and to just hear from you, hear your stories. I think it was really, really important. Um, Dr. Brown said we should share our stories. And it made me think, even before she asked me to start talking, I started thinking about what did, I didn't meet any of my grandparents, just FYI. Um, so, yeah. It made me start thinking about where I come from and how my background and my upbringing made me who I am today. And I think that's really special in all of our history. So I want to thank everyone. Thank you to the audience. This was great. Um, and yeah, looking forward to more events like this that helps us to connect. Um, the most important part of this book was the relations, you know, it, yeah. I can't say too much, but you can buy the book from Venus Envy or Fernwood. You have 10% off. And thank you, 